in the 14th chapter. It's good to see so many here uh, this evening, and we're going to continue on with the teaching that we started last week. Our theme to this new module three that we're beginning is righteousness, is verse 34, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. The king's favor is toward a wise servant, but his wrath is against him that causes shame. And so this is the theme about these things. Slide one, if you would, just a, a, a little bit of replay. We're in the series overall that I'm calling Applying the Book to Life. Next slide, please. We started last week in module three, and uh, this is the module we're calling Applying the Book to My Politics. I... Um, I intend that after this module is over, the next one I feel that I'm going to do is applying the book to my finances, and I think that'll be an interesting one. But I will say, um, the more I've studied and worked on this and stuff, I'm, I'm finding the bigger it's getting, and, and so I may be on this one a little longer than I had originally thought that I would. And at this point, I doubt that that's any reason for surprise. It seems to keep happening that way. But the theme, the topic of this first session uh, in, in, in this module is let every soul, Romans 13 and 1, let every soul be subject unto higher power, powers. That's delegated authorities. Romans 13, 1 on screen, please. And that's, that's government. Everybody say government delegated influence of government, I should say. For there is no power but of God, the powers that are ordained of God. I don't, I don't have time to go and fully back it up, but I can back up in the Word of God that the concept of human government is not a human invention. It came and it was the principle of it was ordained by God. That same verse in the message version, which I like to use as a commentary sometimes, they hit it on the head, this particular verse. It said, let every soul be subject unto, or I'm sorry, I was reading King James again. The message says, be a good citizen. Everybody say good citizen. All governments are under God insofar as there is peace and order. It's God's order. So live responsibly as a citizen. I think that is, that is excellently summing up what Paul was saying there. So that takes us to slide three which is uh, the topic that we started last night. The subtopic is biblical Christian citizenship. We did not get done that, so next slide, please. Uh, we're going to continue uh, tonight with Christian or biblical citizenship continued. We talked about last week, why should I even care about politics? I think we did a good job, I hope, outlining to us the rationale for the importance of it. Go to slide five, please. And we talked last week about the fact that if Christians are not engaged with politics, decisions will be made by people who think God is irrelevant and the truth of God's word does not exist. And we are living, and I might even add suffering in, a condition within our country that has been allowed to happen exactly for this reason okay and so we're going to do just a super fast little uh upgrade of our, our recap and then we're going to go into the topic continue let's pray in jesus name lord we love you thank you for the people of god that have come tonight and i'm asking you to bless this session lord as bishop of this church i enter into this pulpit and i'm asking you to help me to deliver wisdom and understanding from your word that will help us in our walk with God. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Mm -hmm. Greet four or five folks around you, whoever you can reach, and bless them in the name of the Lord as you're seated. All right, let's, let's uh, get moving in this. I, I, I want to recap just one thing we did last week. We talked about partly at least, about the spiritual nature of politics and, and how that the political things are absolutely spiritual things. They're, they're not spiritual by themselves, but they're spiritual by virtue of what influences them. We covered six principles last week of biblical citizenship toward rightful government, and uh, that's 
uh, again later at some point we well, we'll talk about what happens if you're on an unrightful government but but we're working off the assumption that it's rightful government uh, number one we we uh, dealt with the issue that we have a dual citizenship we're we're king we're we're a citizen of earth and of heaven we are to submit to government we are also to pray for government we're also to pay for government <laughs> <coughs> that was a real popular one. <laughs> we are to honor or respect government. And the sixth one is right down our alley anyway, but we are to persuade government. We are to peacefully influence government. And the greatest way that that happens is not with a, uh, not with a, <coughs> you know, a banner, you know, it's with soul winning. It's, it's influencing people with the kingdom of God because separation of church and state is not a separation of God and government, all right? So that's the kind of things we talked about last week. So let's pick up now and continue this thought. Uh, bring up slide six, if you would. Let me give you a super quick civics lesson. And that is, and the question is, what is politics? And uh, the, politics is simply a way people living in groups make decisions and agreements so that they can live together, okay? That's a super simple explanation but i think it, it 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 fits the genre of what we're talking about if you talk about politics or government it just means the way that that a group of people makes decisions now in our world right now there are four major types of government now there's there's some lesser n types and there's some mixtures of all these but they're there but basically it boils down to four basic ones number one is a monarchy and that is, uh, that is where there is one inherited ruler, okay? Uh, then, then there is democracies. And by the way, America is not a democracy. <laughs> These people run around saying it's going to destroy democracy are either lying or stupid. Or a wicked combination of the two. <laughs> because we are not a democracy. Because democracy, a true democracy, is the is the tyranny of the 51, meaning the 51 percent. <laughs> we are a constitutional republic, and we, there's very good biblical reasons for that. But anyway, the, the, an, another type of government is oligarchies, okay? And that's where a small group of elites uh, kind of run a thing. Most of the time, they're either warlords or they're uh, they're high-level financial people or whatever. Then the last one, the fourth one, is totalitarianism, or sometimes it's called authoritarianism. But the truth is, what it really is, it's Marxism or Maoism. Okay. Now, we're going to talk later about some of these. And interestingly, America is at the moment kind of a mixture of several of these things. And they're all competing with one another right now as to which one is going to kind of take the lead. And that's why the, the elections and we have you know, and so forth, they're all very, very important for that reason. And, uh, but we, we ended last week with this idea, what do you do if, if you're, you're, we have dual citizenship and we're, we're a citizen of the kingdom of God and yet we're, we're also citizens of the earth, whatever you know, place we're living? And what happens if if the expectations of the spiritual kingdom and the expectations of the natural kingdom collide. Now, I will tell you many, many times they don't collide. We're able to oftentimes live peaceably, as the scripture said, to do, but there are times when they collide. Okay? And certain governments start demanding certain things that is contrary to what God's kingdom demands. And, the, and so... We, we ended last week with Peter made it clear in Acts 5 when he said, and I quote him, we ought to obey God rather than men. Okay. Now the issue is why. That's where I want to pick up tonight. Is why, why should we obey God rather than men? Here's why. We are, and I'm talking about the church. Everybody say the church. We are a spiritual kingdom. Kingdom. It's everything surrounds the king. Now, this is a hard concept for Americans to wrap our head around because that's not our norm. We are America's not a kingdom. We 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 ejected that from England. 
We didn't want that because there was there was issues with. But but God's God's kingdom is a kingdom. And here's the thing: the spiritual kingdom overrides all earthly matters. The the earthly kingdoms are ultimately subordinate to spiritual kingdoms. Okay, and if not just by spiritual influence, by the time we get to the to the millennial reign. The millennial reign is literally a political kingdom of God that is going to rule the earth. Now, Matthew 6 and 33 on screen, <clears throat> Jesus said, Seek ye first uh, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So it's, it's his kingdom. It's his righteousness. Okay. So the spiritual kingdom that we're a part of it, it, and I guess I'm saying it this way. Bring up slide seven, if you would. God's kingdom, which is what we call the church, but we're talking about God's kingdom, is a monarchy. It has a specific type of, of government that it is. <clears throat> the definition of it's on screen there. A monarchy is a political system based upon the undivided sovereignty or rule of a single person. The term applies to states in which supreme authority is invested in the monarch, an individual ruler who functions as the head of state and who achieves his or her position through heredity. Most monarchies allow only male succession, usually from father to son. Okay. Now, by the way, this was the common type of government throughout world history especially when you go back to the ancient days. Now, in modern times, this is still happening in the world, but, but the other forms of government, the other four that I mentioned, there's, there's examples of all of them, too. We have a lot of mix in the, in the latter part of the church age compared to what was going on in the Old Testament and ancient days. So um, <clears throat> bring up Philippians chapter 2 on screen for a moment. Uh, and, and notice that, that the monarchy, and by the way, you know, England, we pushed all that off. Now, England has a king, queen, all that kind of stuff, but really, even they've diffused it. You know, the king's not really the king over there. He's more of a, uh, a figurehead. The, the actual government's run by the prime minister and all of that. That's not the case in the kingdom of God. I want to tell you who our king is. Somebody needs to say Jesus. I keep, I keep wanting to hear Sister Mabel sing that song, Long As I Got King Jesus. <laughs> Don't need nobody else. <laughs> and I love the fact that in a, in a typical monarchy, it, it's male secession from father to son. Now, Philippians 2 and 9 says, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him, talking about Jesus, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, everybody say Jesus, Every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth. There's something going on down at the core. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That verse is demonstrating the truth that is peppered throughout all the word of God. That God's kingdom, the church, is a spiritual monarchy. And by the way, that, that passage we just read beautifully describes one God theology. Beautifully describes it. Um, now, so the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, and Jesus was born as a result, and he was, according to the Word of God, called the only begotten Son of the Father. Now, this was not an eternal Son that was made by an eternal God. This was God that robed himself in flesh in the body of Jesus Christ. And it makes beautiful sense in, in all of this. But here's the deal. It was God in flesh. So therefore, our first loyalty is, no matter what's going on in our life, is to our king and his kingdom. The spiritual kingdom of the church is a greater kingdom than any earthly government. We, we haven't got controversial yet, so I'm not sure why. We need a little more amens here. Now, but again, though, what we do have a dual citizenship. So just because one is subordinate to the other does not mean we don't have responsibility to the lesser. 
Ephesians 2, 19 on screen. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens, everybody say citizens, with the saints and of the household of God. You are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So the, the Bible clearly teaches that that God's monarchy, God's kingdom, the church in the New Testament age that we're in, is a, is a kingdom that is made up of other kingdoms. It is a kingdom within kingdoms. It is, it is made up of other nations. Um, and it operates in every nation around the world. But we have responsibilities to both, and we have to balance our obligations. So 1 Peter 2 and 9, bring it up on screen. Listen to what the Apostle Peter said. He said, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. Okay, So the priesthood is our ministry. The nation is our, is our kingdom. We are a peculiar, which, which a modern word from King James would be special, people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness uh, into his marvelous light. Now watch. And he makes the distinction. In times past, you were not a people. But now, everybody say now, we're the people of God. And in other words, we have become a spiritual political entity. I don't mean political in the sense of voting. I just mean that this is more than just a, just, the church is more than just a spiritual thing that's trying to save people. It is become the political arm of the kingdom of God. But it operates not in the same way as earthly governments do. It operates all around the world. And it operates underneath other, uh, other nations. So in verse 11, watch this. He, goes, he writes on, he said, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. Now here's the deal. You, you were not this before. You've been, you're no longer that anymore. But you're brought into the kingdom of God. But now I'm going to write unto you as if you were still strangers and pilgrims. I want you to abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. What he's trying to describe here is that we are citizens of a heavenly kingdom. But we're sojourning in an earthly kingdom. In our case, it's an American kingdom, but you know, wherever the church is in the earth, this verse applies. And so, do you understand the dual citizenship? We're, we're, we're citizens of heaven, but we're working in the earth. In other words, we're, we got a green card. And anybody that's ever dealt with dual citizenships understand this better than most. You have responsibility to both. We are a spiritual kingdom that interacts with earthly kingdoms. And to do this, now hear me real carefully here, to do this right, it requires applying wisdom, not Yahooism. <laughs> when people just get Yahooish and they say, well, bless God, this is what I'm going to do. And I, you're not using wisdom with that. Because everyone, to, to interact with earthly agencies and still correctly represent the heavenly agency requires wisdom. <clears throat> so he goes on in verse 12, having your conversation, or in other words, your behavior, honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, you may by your good works, everybody say good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves. Now here's what he's saying. He said, you're, you're, you're members of a higher kingdom. You are you are members of God's monarchy. But until his monarchy is established physically, which is coming at the end of the church age, until that happens, we operate in the earth under earthly kingdoms of various sorts and governments of various sorts. So here is the instruction. Here's how you interact with your earthly kingdom. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake whether it be to the king as supreme, <clears throat> that is, of course, under a monarchy. We're not under a monarchy, so the next verse applies more to us. Or under governors, 
as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers or for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. And you're doing it as free. Or in other words, you're not doing it because of you're a slave. But you're, and, and you're not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness. But as the servants of God. So here's what he says. So you understand, the whole premise of this is the dual citizenship. He's saying we're, we're, the, we're members of a higher, greater kingdom. But we all live in subordinate kingdoms around the earth, and this is, how you get, this is how you interact with them, and this is how you deal with them. And he sums it up in verse 17. Honor all men. That's cultures. That's no matter what culture you're in, no matter what area you're in. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. That's the church. Fear God or respect God. That's King Jesus. And then honor the king is talking about honoring the local government that you happen to be living under. In whatever time of history you're in, in whatever geography you're in, it, 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 it applies to everyone. But you see, you can understand how it's trickier to work in some cultures than it is others. And so, so this, this requires wisdom. And America right now it has a mix of, we do have some democracy among us, but we're not a, we're not a democracy, but we, ha we have some oligarchy going on among us. We have, we have uh, political elites. We have Hollywood elite type people, money people that are influencing things. We got socialist communism trying to raise its, its, its uh, head again uh, in our culture. And it's doing it, even right now, it's doing it through one of the major political parties. Like un, unseen in any time in my lifetime anyway. Uh, but we, what we're, what's happening in America right now, we're a mix. We have a mix of all four of those types of governments that are all kind of... And, and the reason that they're all sort of can, can even function is because of what we really are. And that is we are a constitutional republic that gives room for people who don't agree to be able to work together. Now, we'll get into that into another session down the road, but what I'm just trying to get to your attention right now is we have a mix of these things, and, and the political battles of our time is a warring among those types of, the spirits of those types of governments that are vying for control, and every one of them would like to do away with the American form of government because it, it was originated as a biblically influenced type of government. And I'll prove all that before we're done this module. But I do want to say this. Make no mistake, God rules over the affairs of men. And he can at any time step in and override anything that's going on among man. Can you say amen? Mm -hmm. Typical answer to that is if you remember old King Nebuchadnezzar. He was the most powerful man of his day, most powerful ruler of his day. And God one day just had enough. <laughs> and I'll, we'll deal with that in a minute, but, but it, it, that brings me to this point. The church has got to stop this concept we've put our head in the ground, kind of like an ostrich when it comes to political stuff, because we, we just say, well, the, the Bible says the Lord puts in kings and stuff, and so it doesn't matter you know, who we vote for or none of that, because everybody, whoever's, whoever wins the election is God's will. You need to stop that <laughs> because it is not biblically accurate. Every leader is not God's choice. Sometimes we get God's will, and oftentimes we get the will of people. And unfortunately, sometimes we even get the will of the devil. Perfect example was King Saul. He wasn't God's choice. Well, you say, well, God chose him. Well, God chose him, but the the... the he, God, it's interesting that God's kingdom is a monarchy, yet when he gave human government to the nation he started, which was Israel, he did not choose a monarchy for them to operate. They chose it because they wanted to be like all the other governments around them. What God gave them was a system of judges where he was the king, 
but yet he had different judges that ruled on his behalf and so forth. And, and the, real, the real interesting thing is that I think that America, modern America, and I, when I say modern, I'm talking about more at our founding, uh, is, is, is closer to ancient Israel when they were under decentralized judges as a government. We're closer to that. So, the, so that's why I say America is sort of a New Testament mirror uh, a, a Christian version of what God was trying to accomplish in ancient Israel. The first choice that God made of ancient Israel was a form of government that had never been seen on the earth at that time. God did a decentralized government. So God didn't even use kings because he didn't want anybody competing with him. He said, we don't need another king. I'm king. <laughs> you, you follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So again, we, so what God did, I believe that America, I believe the American Constitution and the, and the founding papers of this nation are incredibly anointed documents. They were formulated, not perfectly, but they're formulated with huge impact of biblical influence. And, and that's why we are not a democracy. We are a constitutional republic. And it's why political issues matter we we are we're not we're not open to the tyranny of just whoever wants to vote to 51 percent and and by the way if we were that we would be in heap big trouble right now in the spiritual condition of our land so the the, the constitution is what keeps all that at bay and that was a godly thing now here's why all this matters proverbs 29 bring it up on screen when the righteous are in authority the people rejoice but when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. Does that make sense? Of course it does. And we in America understand it every four years or so. And sometimes even every two years with all the lesser things that we get. Our, our government kind of flows back and forth. We can go from great, great administrations to crazy administrations to don't even know how that administration is functioning. We, we see it all we, because, again, we're in a very unique, decentralized kind of a deal. It's a very interesting point. And by the way, when America was formed in that kind of government, <clears throat> no other government in the world was formulated. It was known as the Great American Experience Experiment. But <clears throat> I'm going back to this concept that every leader is not God's choice. Bring up Hosea 4. I'm sorry, Hosea 8. <coughs> On screen, look at verse 4. This is the Lord talking to Israel. said, they, everybody say they, have set up kings, but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not. Of their silver and of their gold, they have made them idols that they may be cut off. So here, what God is saying to, to a political people, he said, you, you put in kings to rule you. I didn't choose them. You chose them. You've made princes. That's that secondary level government. Uh, government. And, and, and God said, you didn't, you didn't check with me. You didn't ask for my direction. And you, you took silver and gold and turned it into an idol. You took your blessed economy and turned it into your God. Now you should be connecting the dots already about what happened to America. Thy calf, O Samaria, hath cast thee off. Mine anger is kindled against them. How long will it be ere they attain uh, to innocency? And that word innocency in modern times, we would use the word cleanness. He, God says, how long are you going to continue to err until you become clean? So that's just one example. There's, there's others, but I'm just pointing out, you need to stop assuming that every leader that wins an election is somehow God's will. Not at all. Now, that said, if you bring up Daniel chapter 2, I will show you that God does intervene from time to time. Look at verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of our God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are His. Now here's what God will do. He changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings, and setteth up kings, and giveth wisdom unto the wise, and knowledge unto them that know understanding. 
He said, well, that's contradictory. Not, no, it's not contradictory. What, what, it, what it's saying is, uh, is that sometimes God had nothing to do with who's in leadership, and other times God does step in, get involved. Okay? And when God gets involved, because again, the spiritual kingdom is overruling of earthly kingdoms. But Daniel noted that God does not establish certain, uh, that he does, I'm sorry, establish certain kings at certain times, but there's a reason for it, and that is... God will step in over the affairs of men under two occasions. Number one, he will do it when he needs to have a certain leader at a certain time and place for the sake of prophetic things that have to unfold. God will bring about his will on the earth. Okay. The other time that God gets involved is when people pray him in to the situation. God does not set up every ruler. But he does intervene due to prayer. And if a, if, a, if a certain time requires a certain historical turn to be made to fulfill God's word and prophecy, God will make sure that the right person is, is in the right place at the right time. But he's not picking and choosing every leader of every government. You got to get that balance. Now, this goes back. Bring up on screen. We could mo most of us here could quote this, but Second Chronicles chapter seven, verse fourteen is the famous verse we were using a little bit ago while we were praying, and it says, "If my people, everybody say my people." Mm -hmm. Well, who is my people? That's God's kingdom, His monarchy. Everybody say the church. They're called by His name. If they will humble themselves and pray. And seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. He's not talking about the government. He's talking to the church. Everybody say, then. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. It was just being quoted earlier in the service tonight. Watch verse 15. Now mine eyes shall be open and mine ears attent under the prayer that is made in this place. This is why the Bible tells the church to pray for those that are in authority. Pray for those that are in power. Pray for those that have political responsibility. What God is saying to the church is, uh, I'm not going to get involved in this other than certain things to accomplish my overall will. But the day-to-day -day stuff, God doesn't get into the minutia near as much unless the church are praying. But he's willing to. He wants to get involved in it. And the perfect example of that was what we already mentioned, and that was Nebuchadnezzar. But notice, notice he said, I will be listening for the prayer that is made in this place. That means the church. So here is what I'm trying to teach in this module. The Bible clearly indicates uh, that the saints of God have political responsibility. When he said, if the church will pray and get a hold of me, I will heal their land, he was talking about their politics. He wasn't talking about saving everybody. He was said, I'll save you from a corrupt government. I'll fix the mess that sin creates automatically. Nebuchadnezzar was an incredibly powerful man. And his kingdom was unchallenged at the time. But he was also carnal as a gourd. And God tolerated him for a season. And, and by the way, God tolerates a lot of carnality. Sometimes even in the church for a season. And he can still use people that are carnal. Doesn't mean they're saved. Now watch. His arrogance crossed a certain line. And God had been dealing with him. God had been giving him dreams. God had been talking to him. And, and instead of humbling himself, he just got more arrogant. And one, one morning he walks out on the, on the balcony and he's looking. He still starts beating his chest. And I'm this and that and a bag of chips. And, and, and I'm the greatest thing there. And God just said, you know, I've just had enough. <laughs> Daniel chapter 4 and verse 16 shows the judgment of God upon Nebuchadnezzar. Let his heart be changed from man's. And let a beast heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. Now, we know the story of Nebuchadnezzar. He was the most vicious, iron-clad ruler of that day. Everyone shook at the name Nebuchadnezzar. 
But let me tell you who doesn't shake at the name Nebuchadnezzar. It's the King Jesus that we serve. He doesn't, he doesn't shake at all. And so finally, he judged him and turned him into an animal for seven years. He was eating grass like an animal out in the field. And this, now watch verse 17, this matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomever he will and sets up over the basest of men. In other words, the lesson of Nebuchadnezzar was he was the most powerful, prideful man of his day as far as kingdoms go. And, and the reason that God did what he did is just to be a reminder, because his story is going to go into the Word of God and into history. It was going to be a reminder to mankind and to every king and to every monarch to understand that uh, you may think you're all this and something else. But you need to understand that, the, that the, the earthly kingdoms are subordinate to God's spiritual kingdom. And God will intercede wherever he needs to. So the concept of human government was God-ordained. And God can manipulate even carnal leaders when he has to to bring about his will. And it's why the Apostle Paul called civil government the ministers of justice in Romans 13. He didn't mean ministers the way, you know, pulpit preachers are. He's not talking about ministry ministry. He said political leaders are a different form of ministers. They're messengers of God, but they have a specific purpose. And God will cause political change to keep up with his overall prophetic word or promises that he's made. So America, where we're at today is the United States is at a crossroads of spiritual direction. We've been battling it out for 30 years. And the issue that's at, at stake in our hour is it's the spiritual direction of the land, the spiritual direction of the government, etc. And it's going to play out politically. Now, at the moment, the, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, the two major parties, and that's really the only way in our form of government, it's the only way anybody's going to have any chance of being elected to high, high office is they have to have the assistance of a party to do it. The Democratic Party has offered up the most extreme leftist ticket in American history. I'm not talking about modern history. I mean since the land was started, since the government was started. This Tim Walz uh, is, is extreme left wing. And you go back and read what he has done as governor, see the news, some of you that are up to date on stuff, you shake your head and you think, my God, how in the world could this man become president? Uh, Miss Harris, uh, she doesn't have near as, as long of a record, or a, a big of a record, I should say, but hers goes back to San Francisco liberalism. It's extreme. And really the policies, now this is, I'm not making this statement from, uh, from something that they've admitted as much as something that I just observed policy and I recognize that that particular ticket that is being offered up at this particular time in our history is, a f is really a representative of, of Maoism or Marxism. Now, I'll take time to prove that later, but that's not what I want to do right now. The MAGA movement that is happening on the other side is, is fighting against it and pressing against it. This is spiritual warfare that is taking place. And we're living in a time that if you, if you, if you say anything against this, you're called a racist. And this, that, Listen, the church needs to ignore all that stuff. Don't, don't get sucked into that and fooled into thinking that, that just because you have a difference of opinion that you're lazy. It's a bunch of lies and nonsense. Now, I told you when I started this that I'll tell you when I'm in the book and I'll tell you when I'm stepping out of the book. <laughs> and I'm going to step out of the book for a moment. And I'm gonna just, this is just me talking. I want to share a couple of th interesting things with you because I want to show you how this battle has, is unfolding. It's really an amazing thing to see. We're, we're seeing historical things, whether you realize it or not. Uh, this has been another huge week in current events. Just since we taught last week on between part one and part two, uh, the, the former president has been shot at again. Uh, this is a second, asa I was on my way home from service when the, the night that that happened and I, I literally 
I, it was so funny what I heard on the radio. It, 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 I, it, I laughed out loud. The, the, the guy said, I want you to realize the former president has just escaped two assassination attempts. That's the exact same amount of interviews that Miss Harris has conducted. <laughs> he said, let that sink in. And I literally laughed out loud because I thought, yeah, that's the, that's the truth. <laughs> 50-some uh, versus less than like two. It, it's an unbelievable thing. But here's the point. Mr. Trump, for all of his uh, antics, uh, and, and he, he has plenty, <laughs> uh, it was prophesied. Now, some of you might, may not know this, but it was prophesied uh, through Gifts of the Spirit back in 2007 was the first major one, then again by the same man in 2015. And <clears throat> I saw the prophecy. I didn't know about it for years. I didn't know about it until he became Back in 2016, when he became the nominee, that's when this stuff started coming out. But many years before he ever even got involved in politics, uh, it was prophesied that, that he would become uh, president. Now, the interesting thing is the same guy that predicted this, and you can call it a prediction or a prophecy, whichever you want, but the same guy who predicted this also predicted 9-11, in advance and Hurricane Katrina years in advance. He made this prophecy in 2007, which is, you know, what, uh, nine years before it was fulfilled. And the interesting thing is, two weeks after Trump's election, the first time, this man, Kim Clement is his name. He died at age 60. And so he never saw the things unfold fully that he spoke. Now, this is just my opinion, and I'm being very clear about that. It is my honest assessment that when Mr. Trump went into the presidency in 2016, I believe it is one of those occasions where we see God step in and overrule over the affairs of men for the purpose of a prophetical turn that had to take place. I don't think he, I don't think God asked the Democrats or the Republicans what they thought about it. I don't think he had any meetings. I think the monarch decided that a change has to be because there's certain times God just steps in. Now, uh, so I believe that he was installed by God. And the reason I say that is because, number one, it's almost the only explanation. I mean, you don't have to be a wizard to figure this out. <laughs> it was against every political odd that, that it could have been. It was against all odds. The entire Democratic Party was against him. Half of the Republican Party was against him. The entire media was against him. All the deep state and the, and the interacting bureaucracy, they're all of it. There, there was, he, was the, he became the singer. By the way, he used to be a Democrat. <laughs> he used to be loved by all these people. All he did was decide to come down the escalator and run for government, and now all of a sudden he's, a, he's, he's Hitler. <laughs> a bunch of nonsense, you know. But here's the thing. I believe Trump was spiritually installed. Now, if that's the case, we only have two choices. So either God put him in there or Antichrist put him in there. Because Antichrist can do that too. You with me? Uh, just my opinion, right? Okay. You don't have to agree with it. I'm just telling you why I think what I'm doing. It is when I see... When I, now, so then I begin to watch. And to be honest with you, when he won, it was a stunning event. Historical. Never seen anything like it. But, I st but none of us knew what he's going to do. But I watched the next four years the incredible policy decisions that he made, the governmental decisions. Now, I wish he was a more of a statesman. He, he's not. He's sloppy and, and stuff. He, and and, and he, he, he lets people get under his skin and all that. But forget all that and just but you watch what happened. In those four years, we had an incredible amount of peace, and prosperity in our country like we hadn't had in many, many years. And he was accomplishing things against all odds. Again, 
He even, how many, do you know how many presidents have been trying to create Middle East peace? <laughs> Trump did it in two years. Now, unfortunately, he was trying to take the credit for it. And I, I remember thinking, you know, Mr. Trump, you got to acknowledge this wasn't you. <laughs> God was doing the Abraham Accords is what I'm, what I'm referring to. He was accomplishing things that were just stunning. And you think to yourself, there's no way that that can happen without spiritual assistance. It's either got to be Christ spirit or the Antichrist spirit. It, it's it's got to be one. And when I observed that most of his policies, not all, but most of his policies were, were generally fairly biblically aligned, and then I watched the incredible sp uh, warfare, intense warfare that was f fighting against everything he was trying to do, that causes me to simply know them by their fruit. So I look at it and I say, that's not Antichrist that did that. Christ Spirit did that, in my opinion. Now, and another thing that helps me to come to that conclusion is, and again, some of you may, may know, may not know, but and I don't remember, I know I've had this conversation with some people, but I don't remember who I've talked to, but it's an interesting little historical fact that when you go back into, there were three women back in the, uh, going back 150 years to <clears throat> in Scotland that were uh, known, at, they were three praying women, incredibly prayer warrior type women. And these three women are credited historically for instigating the great Scottish revival, Christian revival that took place back in, the, in, in those days in the 1800s. And, and when, when one of those three women died, her Bible was passed on to her one of her children. I don't remember which one it was. I think it was their daughter. Anyway, more time is passed, and she passes away, and it, then it's passed on to her son, and it's either the, it's either the great-grandson or, or the, uh, it's either grandson or great-grandson. I can't remember how many generations were in there, but the point is, is the Bible of the woman, of one of those three women that was the powerful instigators of the Scottish Revival, had her Bible passed down to her great or either great-great-grandchild, who happened to be named Donald. <laughs> the Trumpster. <laughs> and those that know Trump understand he's Scottish. That's his background. That's his, you know... And, and by the way, that's why he's friendly to the church, even though he's not a Christian. He doesn't live it. He doesn't live Christ-like life. But he's friendly to the church, and he respects the church because he knows his great-grandmother would come back from the dead and deal with him. <laughs> and by the way, when he was sworn in as president of the United States in 2016, it was upon that Bible that he laid his hand. Now, you can, you can look into all this stuff and say, well, it's just, you know, it doesn't really mean anything. Well, I, you know, you interpret it however you want. But to me, it seems pretty obvious. And then, and so he's, he's been friendly to the church. Again, he's not living it. And, and, but here, here, let me quote you just a little bit of the prophecy. Okay? And you can find all this stuff uh, on, on YouTube, by the way. But he, the, the prophecy in 2007 was this. I will turn a trump into a trumpet. He is a hot-blooded man. Yeah, he is. <laughs> He's hot-blooded, God said. He does not know me, but I know him. He will go into office without my spirit, but he will leave with my spirit. Now that indicates to me that Trump doesn't know God. He doesn't walk with God. He's not a Christian. He knows the concept of God. And he knew his grandmother believed in God. But I think what the Lord was prophesying there, he said, when he, he's going to go into office, he's not even going to know why he's in the office. I'm going to take him into the office. But by the time he goes out of the office, I think it was a prophecy that God's going to fill him with the Holy Ghost. Now, here's the, here's the problem. It didn't seem to happen in the, in the first term, but here's the thing. The same guy who, who spoke all this in 2017, also part of the prophecy was that he would, he would serve two terms. So when he did not go in that second time, of course, 
Now, understand that 90% of everything this guy prophesied came to pass, except that. That's the only thing that didn't come to pass. And I remember all the Christians that were rising up in anger back then and said those were false prophets and yada, yada, yada. And, and the men who said that was going to happen. Well, I remember thinking, you know, guys, you might want to slow down here a little bit. Because if something is a true prophecy of God, if it's one of those times that God has a will He's going to do no matter what, then it's going to be fulfilled no matter what happens. And usually when God does things, He likes to do it against all odds so that He gets the glory for it. So, you know, we're, we're less than you know six, seven weeks away from election, so we'll see what unfolds. And, and, but I would assume that if, if, he, if this prophecy was true, then he's going to go back in. If it doesn't happen, then you got to back up and you say, okay, you know, he, he, he was off. I mean, again, I'm not going uh, to make excuses for it, but either God's in it or it's not. And, and I think that it's interesting. I think that in some ways, uh, Mr. Trump and Mr. Nebuchadnezzar has some things in common. I think that hot-blooded nature they had, the ego, the pride, the whole deal, uh, I, I think that he's got that. But you see, what God did to Nebuchadnezzar is he humbled him for seven years and then healed him and put him back in office. And he was a good king after that. And some are suggesting that maybe all these shootings and assassination attempts, I don't know how, how that doesn't affect you and, and humble you. And, and to realize that that first bullet came through was an eighth of an inch from killing him. Only the hand of God is the only explanation I have for why he turned his head in just a certain way at a certain moment. And maybe, maybe it's his Nebuchadnezzar moment to bring humility to him. I don't know. But the critics have asked the, the church, how can you vote for a man who's morally challenged? I guess I would, I would start by saying, well... <laughs> Can somebody point to me somebody that's been in high office that hasn't been morally challenged? <laughs> the answer to that question, by the way, is it's biblical citizenship. I have a responsibility to influence my government to whatever level that is, and I have to do it right and serve God with the right spirit. But understand something, folks. Don't get wrapped up in all this stuff thinking that that's the salvation. Government's not our salvation. Government's not even our business. Our business is the kingdom of God. Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. That's what our job is. So no matter who wins later this fall, I think one will bring more grief than the other for sure. But I'll tell you this, it doesn't matter to me. I'm going to keep on doing what I've been doing. I'm going to keep on preaching, keep on praying people through, keep on doing the work of God, you know. So, because I don't look to the government as my salvation. Government cannot save us, okay. So don't make the government your God. Don't make it your provider. Our role is not to bring change by political activism. The, our role is to bring change as we are able to by spiritual influence. And most of that is done through doing the work of the church, which is winning souls. We are told to be salt and light to a lost world. Now, if we're going to be salt and light, then we also, that means that we have to be informed salt and informed light and as i said to you last week jesus said that he we were to take everything he taught and take it to the nations it is not just a message of salvation that the church is to carry we are to carry the whole counsel of god to a lost world we obviously highlight the salvation issues first but then after that once you're in the kingdom now we got to start teaching you a whole new way of thinking whole new way of doing things and it's true no matter where you live in the world, no matter what culture you're in, no matter what government you're in, no matter what you believe, we all have to bring that in and lay it down at the altar. And so the church has to live by, by a godly example to give credibility to our Christianity. So you can't, you can't be a, a, a wild hare to the government and, 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 and have credibility in your Christianity. 
Jesus' focus was to seek and to save the lost. His focus was not trying to reform the Roman Empire. He would influence it when the opportunities came, but his deal was to seek and save the lost. And we must work under these human governments, so our job is not to be out there fussing and carrying on with the government all the time. It's just influence it as we are able to do and pray. Enter in the spirit world because we are a spiritual kingdom. Political figures are not saviors. They're just people like us. They need God. And, 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 uh, but, but, but here's the deal. Their policy decisions, not their personality, their policy decisions have a huge impact on our day-to-day -day life and work. In the past three and a half years, we have seen mortgage rates increase by 59.2%. Food is up 21.8%. Shelter is up 22.7%. Auto insurance is up 55.6%. Energy is up 31.8%. And overall inflation was up 19.7% over the four-year period. And hear me when I say this. It was all driven by poor policy not poor personality. Policy did that. If a, if a person is governing well by keeping my life peaceable, I don't really care what their personality is like. I mean, I, I, I wish, you know, that they were better person, but whatever, you know, just get out of my hair. <laughs> policy did that. Everybody say policy did that. And, and here's the thing, all, most all of that was created by this, by this uh, among a couple other things, by this in, Inflation Reduction Act that poured gazillions of dollars, printed money. It was invented money. It wasn't even borrowed money. It's invented money. All of that just, and, and when you just generate money and pour it into the system, you create inflation. Okay. The, all of this happened because of policy decisions. Now, here's the thing. The vice president has proudly said she was the tie-breaking vote on that, which they were, because the Senate was divided 50-50. And when that happens, the vice president steps in and casts the deciding vote. So she personally <laughs> came and pushed it over the line. It is fascinating to me. You know, every once in a while, the truth comes out of these people. And it, just this past week, the president... You never know when he's going to have a cogent moment. <laughs> it's kind of a gamble every time you hear him talk. But he actually had a cogent moment the other day, and I, and, and I, I thought, did people hear what he just said? He literally said this. He, he, was talking about, he was talking about the fact that Ms. Harris, that he was there promoting, said she cast the tie-breaking vote for the Inflation Reduction Act. And then Mr. Biden just kind of looked. He said, you know, we probably ought to, ought to really call it what it really was. And that was the, the, the Green New Deal Act. <laughs> and I thought, is the world just tuned him out so much they're not listening to anything that he's saying? <laughs> he literally was saying, that if, and if you look back, you understand, if you know the policies, what that thing did is it shoved tons and tons of government money at all kinds of left-wing stuff. And Mr. Biden was having a coach of saying we probably really ought to have named it what it really was. But that'd probably be a little too much to ask for government nowadays. <laughs> Bring up slide eight. So I can remember what it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I took a screenshot of this the other day. This is the historical positions that the vice president had just four years ago. She wanted to end immigration detention. She wanted to have taxpayer-funded gen gender care transition for migrants and people in jail. She wanted to cut immigrant detention by 50%, close family-private facilities, decrease ICE funding, end ICE detentions, Medicare for all, including illegals, which means doing away with private health insurance, become government health care, she wanted to ban fracking. She wanted to decriminalize border crossing, defund Trump's wall. Now, that was her official positions when she was running for president in 2019. 
and it is consistent with everything she's done up until that as a as a San Francisco progressive. That's 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 what she is. Okay. And it's also consistent with everything she's done and voted. You, did you know when she was the Senate, by the way, she was she was acknowledged as the most liberal senator in the entire Senate in serious competition with Bernie Sanders. <laughs> and that's what she was. Now, in the last 60 days since she became the nominee, she has flipped on almost every one of those things, but refuses to give us an explanation of why. And she has admitted that she intends to let the Trump tax cuts expire here shortly, which is going to add $2,600 a year in taxes to the average family of four. And she wants to, she's announced this as an official position. She wants to tax unrealized gains. Now, let me tell you how that works. That means if you have an investment for your retirement or something like that and the stocks go up one day, all of a sudden you've got, you've got uh, a, a gain. Now, at the end of the year, if, you're, if you've made money in your account, you have to pay taxes on that account, even though you don't even have the money yet. Okay. It, is, it is a financial train wreck. So, so here's what we're left with. When, when they say the exact opposite in the last six days of everything they've been saying for the last several years, you're left with a question. And this is a question for any politician, not just her. But do I believe what they say, or do I believe what they've historically done? That's the dilemma. Now, as an informed, if, if we're going to be salt and light, I have to ask myself, and I have to make a decision. You, as the saints of God, have to make decisions. And here's what I conclude. I think that someone's actions speak louder than their words. And so I think that, and this goes for Trump as well, anybody, it doesn't matter who, but we, we all have past actions that require judgment. Now, the question is, can people change? Yes, of course they can. And thank God, they can. I mean, that's the whole reason we turn the lights on. <laughs> In the church, that's what we preach. <laughs> but but, I, but I, do, I do recognize, though, that we have to understand that, that it needs to be an authentic change. It needs to be an actual change, not just an invented one. So when I ask myself, can people change? Well, I go to the scripture. Je uh, bring up Jeremiah 13, 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. I go to the scripture to find a principle that says most individuals do not have the power to change their character. But they are what they are. And he said, if you're accustomed to doing evil, are you going to all of a sudden overnight start doing good? He said, no more than an Ethiopian or anybody else could change their skin and no more than a leopard can change his spots. Certain things are what they are unless there is inter intervention that comes from a holy God. Oh, I thank God such were some of you, but we've been washed and we've been cleansed. There is changing power in the earth, but it requires God. So since our job is to promote kingdom concepts and values, we must vote for the closest options that we have at any given time. So the idea, how can you vote for an immoral person? Well, every time we vote, we're, we're, I have never in my whole adult life voted for anybody that checked all the boxes that would make me happy as an apostolic saint. There, 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 it, it's a limited choice, you know, so we can only choose from what we got. So many times you either have to do, you could call it the lesser of good e of evils, or you can just say, well, I, if, I can't, if I can't find somebody that checks all the boxes, uh, who checks at least the most boxes? Or who checks at least in general enough boxes that, that heads things in a certain direction versus another direction? That's where I need to put my influence. Okay? Now, it, because it's not about personality. It's about philosophies. And do, there are certain philosophies that align with truth. And there are certain philosophies that are contrary to truth biblical truth I'm talking about and we have to I don't know who turned the air up but we got people cold in here we need to knock it back down um, 
I, I'm thinking, uh, not that it matters, we're, we're about done. <laughs> um, we are in the midst. And I, I tell you what I, I, I want to do. I, I'm going to share that, and then we'll pick up with this next week. We're in the midst in America of an incredible historical thing that's happening. We are seeing in real time a, a humongous political realignment. We are seeing Democrats that are voting Republican and Republicans that are voting Democrats. It's amazing to see. Never seen anything like it. The reason is because something new is unfolding where people in America are starting to shake free of political party influence and vote principled influence. And that's a good thing. It's actually a good thing. And that's why you have people peeling off of both parties and crossing lanes and changing parties and all kinds of stuff because all of a sudden they're realizing this isn't about parties anymore. Th this is about, and I said it before, this isn't about the donkey or the elephant. We're about the lamb's agenda. Amen? And that's what we got to do. Stand with me tonight. Praise God. Once again... Nowhere near getting done what I intended to do. <laughs> so we'll pick up next week. I'm going to talk to you next week about this new alignment that's taking place. I'm going to give you some examples. It's really an incredible thing to behold. I want you to understand something, church. We are in a historic time, and, and we are in a historic event that's unfolding. I don't know which way it's going to go yet, uh, but Brother Grimsley, when he came to the pulpit a few weeks ago, was here, and he said, the saints of God, you need to vote your conscience. This is really what he was trying to say in, 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 the, in the most neutral way that he could. The people of God. Do you know the last election, 40 million people who claimed to be evangelical Christians did not even bother to vote? That's why we have the mess we're in. That's why you're paying so much for eggs. And notice, notice in, in the scripture, God didn't get angry at the nation. He put the responsibility on the church. He said, I'll fix this mess if the church will fix their mess. If the church will get on board, if you'll pray, if you'll turn from your wickedness. Because we have no ability to change the national wickedness. God says, I'll deal with that. I'm the, I'm the monarch of the world. I'll deal with what you can't deal with if you'll deal with what you can deal with. So this is all this is what I'm trying to teach in this series. I'm not really trying to teach position or philosophy. I'm trying to teach the importance of philosophy, okay? That that's what's got to get our attention and that requires us to be to pay attention. It requires us to be informed. And if you're one of those people who just doesn't want to have anything to do with it, well, okay, but I got to tell you it's just not the right position. Biblically, I've got to challenge it that this is our responsibility to have our, ha have our, you say, well, uh, you know, well, it's just, it's just one vote. Yeah, I know. But here's the thing. In our form of government, my vote is my voice. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I have to pick this up next week. But you know, can I remind you what the, what the book said about our voice? We'll be held accountable for every idle word. I'm going to let you marinate on that one as you head out the door tonight. <laughs> Is it possible that we're going to have to give an account to God, not only for our idle words, but for the idle times our actions should have been our words, or our, our words were actions that we didn't take, or we didn't care enough about, or whatever. Or worse, or worse, have we come to church and praise God with our lips, and they'll go to a voting booth and vote for, to empower spirits, that are contrary to the work of our king. Be accountable for every idle word. I'll end with the scripture that says, think on these things. <laughs> Dear Lord, we love you. Thank you for this evening. Wonderful presence of the Lord that we feel. Lord, I feel and sense your presence. And I, feel, I feel an anointing in this. I feel like you're giving good direction to the church. 
Help us, God, in this series to, to learn things that we need to learn about better serving your kingdom. And we will keep our business the king's business. And we'll keep on having revival no matter what unfolds. But, Lord, we'll place our shoulder to the wheel and give influence wherever we can. We give you the praise and glory and honor in the name of Jesus. Everybody said amen. I was informed. Yeah, that's right. Give the Lord a hand clap offering. Give him a shout of praise in closing. Amen. There is? Okay, I was told earlier there wasn't any. Well, yeah, a tiny bit. I think, I, I tell you what, I was told that what little bit we have, we were going to send out uh, to, to others. So we're not going to have food distribution tonight, but probably by next week that we'll have it. The little bit that we have, I was told we we're going to use it because there's just, there's not even enough. If, if everybody walked back there, we wouldn't have enough. So we'll do it that way. God bless you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord. We'll see you this weekend. God bless you in Jesus' name. I know. Well, they, he Hezbollah took receipt of those items like six months ago. According to anything I read, I read in, uh, uh, in Reuters that it was like six months ago they got them. They're playing chess.